Hello, I'm Mike Graziano, and welcome to this series of videos on how to compose a symphony. We're in the middle of composing the second movement. Last time we wrote a sketch of the A melody. This time we'll write the B and C melodies and finish the whole sketch. Let's jump right in where we left off. The name of the game is Contrast. We want a contrasting B part, not a huge contrast, but just enough to prevent the music from getting monochrome. The first melody had a kind of depth and soulfulness, partly because of the long, slow notes. Maybe we want the second tune to be lighter, more cheerful. It'll move a little faster. And I'm putting it in a different key. You want your melodies in different keys so the ears don't get bored. The first melody was in G. This second one is in D. Here I'm trying something very simple, almost like a nursery rhyme. Let's hear what that sounds like. Wow, it's almost fatally cute. But I think it will work. We're going to use the same trick we used in the first melody. The start of the tune sets up very strong expectations because of the repeated melodic patterns. But now we'll start spinning in new directions, breaking the patterns and the expectations. This is a variation, a kind of jaunty variation on the same tune. And here I'll break out of the pattern and put in something different. You can do this any way you like, whatever sounds right to you. Always listen carefully and decide what sounds good to you. Whatever that is, that's what's right. Let's stick in some harmony notes just to flesh out the thought. And let's listen and see if it feels good. I like how the tune is cheerful and bouncy, and then it has a sudden interlude, a break. It goes kind of slow and stately. After that stately little interlude, it needs to go back to bouncy and cheerful. How shall we do that? I could repeat the cheerful beginning phrases, but I think I'll go for entirely new material for the end of the tune. New material keeps the music always fresh, always moving forward. The B tune is basically done, but we need a little transition to get back to the key of G, a bridge passage. How about we do it as straightforwardly as possible, just blam, right back with a C natural. The key of D has a C sharp, the key of G has a C natural, therefore it's the pivot note that flags the fact that we're moving back to the key of G. and then we return to the A tune. Let's listen to that whole B section.
It's good. The structural bones are in place. We may punch it up a bit when we orchestrate it, but it's good for now. One quality that makes it work is that the B section isn't locked into repeating phrases. It changes constantly, the beginning different from the middle, the middle different from the end, so it's going somewhere. Now we can copy and paste in the whole A section again. And now we're ready for a C part. But first, let's listen to the very end of the A part and think about what kind of C part we want. First, I'm going to trim off a little of the A part. Let's make it end a little more incisively the second time around. Our two-bar extension has turned into a one-bar extension. Now, we need to talk philosophy. Let's pause the composition for a moment and talk about the deeper principle. A typical slow movement in the classical period is more cute than profound. It has a kind of lightness and symmetry. It's a charming diversion, but a Mozart slow movement is something special. A good slow movement, a really good one, is a rare miracle, and Mozart was a master at that. How does he do it? A Mozart slow movement might start with a beautiful melody, like the one we crafted here. Not too deep, but with a certain calm, meditative quality and a pinch of cheerfulness in a major key. All very good. Then, Mozart will move to a middle section, a B section, in a minor key. The music is suddenly very introspective. Talk about internal contrast. That sudden emotional depth must have shocked people at the time. The level of harmonic complexity and emotional complexity grows. The piece deepens. Then the music finds its way back to the A melody, and suddenly it doesn't feel so superficial anymore. You feel a profound truth behind the familiar melody. It's like having a conversation with someone, and at first they stick to pleasantries, and then they share something really personal, and then the conversation ends with pleasantries again. But at the end, you know more. You see the depth in the person. That's what makes a Mozart slow movement such a remarkable work of art, and puts it above everyone else writing at the time, in my opinion anyway. So what about our slow movement? Well, we decided on a very short movement to fit a very short symphony, and therefore we don't have the space to create so lovely an effect. The A melody is over in about a minute, and that's too soon to go to a deep and profound B melody. So the B melody is actually even more cheerful and emotionally superficial. Then we come back to the A melody, and it's nice, and has a thoughtfulness to it. But we haven't earned any sense of depth. So far, the piece has no sense of depth. But all is not lost. We still have the C melody. And here, I want us to try the Mozart trick. Let's go for a minor key, more personal, more emotional, more complex. The texture should be darker and richer instead of the disarmingly simple tunes we've had so far. That way, when we come back to the A melody at the very end, well, we'll see if we've earned any sense of emotional depth. I'm going to cheat a little here. Everything I've shown you so far is me composing in real time on the page, a bit edited down, but you get to see the essential composition process. For the C melody, I decided to do something different. Sometimes when I want to get it just right, I'll uh, spin my chair around. Instead of facing my computer, I face my piano keyboard, and I improvise and tinker and listen and work it out by ear. That's what I've done with the C melody. After figuring it out on the keyboard, I've got the outline of it in my head, and now I'll write it down and edit it. I wish I could compose this fast. I'm throwing in harmony ideas. 
I always make sure to put in some hints of bowing marks and articulation marks so that later on I can remember what I was thinking. As you've noticed, I do a lot of writing and then listening. Sometimes I correct what I wrote, sometimes I toss it and try again. It's really important to be constantly going back over what you've done, reassessing it. And now I've typed in the whole C part, which, as I said, I worked out at the keyboard. Let's listen to it and how it flows back into the A melody. I want to make three specific points. First, the C tune avoids a clear rhyming structure because it's trying to be more subtle. It's not even really a formal tune so much as a set of ideas flowing freely from one to the next. Second, on the same topic of free movement, it floats between different keys. It starts out in E minor, the relative minor of G major, so it's very easy to slip into and then it slips right back to G major, and then back to E minor, and then a hint of D major, before returning to G major again. It's unsettled. It covers a lot of ground. And third, notice how the meter keeps changing. Sometimes it's in 3-4, like this part. And sometimes it's in 6-8, where the eighth notes are grouped in threes instead of in twos, like this part. It can't make up its mind to keep switching from twos to threes, adding to that sense of instability. With all of those properties, first, no formal tune but a loose collection of ideas, second shifting from key to key, and third an unsettled shifting meter. With all of that instability, it really has the personality of a small development section, wandering, fragmented, modulating through keys. So when you finally come back to the A melody at the end, you feel like you've been through something. Because the C melody takes you away on an adventure with a little more personal depth and complexity, because of that, when you return to the A melody, the final section feels a little more real and a little more earned. So now we'll just plop in the whole A melody, copy and paste. And with that, we're done with the sketch of the movement. I hope you see how you can do this too. Invent three melodies, put them end to end in this way, and you have a wonderful little piece of music. Let's listen to our creation from the beginning.
It's quite charming, just by itself, but it'll get much better when we orchestrate it. You'll see. We'll start the orchestration in the next video. I hope you enjoyed this one, and thank you all for watching.